So um, in Denver at Rocky Mountain, we see uh, quite a bit of uh, blood cancers um, in, in our practice. Um, and that's actually what we um, subspecialize in. And so um, we uh, have been seeing a lot of acute leukemia in the uh, last six months since COVID-19 has really become um, you know, such a prominent issue in medicine. And so uh, we've adopted some uh, practices um, and, you know, approaches to patients with acute leukemia. And uh, I know specifically about acute lymphoid uh, leukemia is what you're asking about today. And so um, we can definitely focus on that um, as well. Um, the way that I think about this is um, in terms of where the patient is in their treatment. And so um, there's the, the sort of newly diagnosed uh, ALL patient. Um, the patient that's on um, sort of intensive therapy, uh, patients who are on maintenance therapy, and then patients who have completed therapy, um, and, uh, and, and each of those probably deserve special consideration. Um, for the newly diagnosed patient or the patient that is just presenting with acute leukemia, uh, one of the things we think about is, um, you know, missed diagnosis. So a lot of acute leukemia patients present with fever, um, one of the prominent symptoms that's also present in COVID-19. And so, um, you know, infections are prominent in patients who present with a diagnosis of acute leukemia. And, and um, the same is true um, with uh, ALL patients and the same is true with uh, COVID-19 patients so uh, that they can have fever. And so we advocate for testing. Uh, we've adopted a practice of, of testing patients for COVID-19. The test is, uh, that we have available is rapid. It's, um, it's easily available at this, at this point. So um, uh, in addition, prior to starting any therapy, uh, I, I test patients for COVID-19 as well as getting a, a chest CT um, just to see whether or not, um, you know, we're dealing with a patient who might be, who might be infected. And so that's, that's useful knowledge. Um, a, a diagnosis of COVID-19 might actually delay an intensive induction type of therapy. Um, ha however, there's always the possibility that a patient could acquire uh, the infection uh, during induction therapy as well. And we think these patients would be at, at very high risk. There's definitely anecdotal evidence that I have that that is the case. Um, and, so, um, and so all of these considerations should be taken, especially up front. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, we've thought about is, is that um, whether or not we um, could institute sort of a lower intensity uh, sort of approach to some patients who may be at highest risk. And the advantage of this is to, um, one, avoid some myelosuppression, uh, as well as, um, you know, potentially avoid um, as frequent clinic visits and, and basically um, decrease the risk um, due to COVID-19. It's interesting because the mortality risk to cancer patients is high, um, but it's, it's primarily associated with uh, a patient's age, a uh, patient's comorbidities, um, uh, gender even. And so um, those things are still very prominent in terms of, uh, in terms of COVID risk. I, I tell patients that, I, you know, I don't want you to get COVID because I don't want you to get COVID, not just because of your cancer diagnosis. And we see a lot of older patients. Um, and so, uh, you know, with, with AML, um, with ALL, uh, sometimes they're younger, but still, um, you know, in an age range that puts them at a higher, higher mortality risk. So um, that's kind of the way that uh, we've adopted an approach to uh, acute leukemia patients that, you know, that are, um, you know, um, first coming, um, uh, that, that are at presentation. And then in terms of patients that are on therapy, um, we, uh, at the hospitals that I work at, the oncology units are, are adopting a very strict um, COVID-19 um, sort of prevention strategy, um, sort of isolated from the rest of the hospital, uh, just to try and minimize any risk to patients that are admitted uh, who have acute leukemia. Um, and so uh, that's kind of our approach to when patients are on therapy. Um, for patients who are on maintenance therapy, there's been some written about uh, reducing maintenance therapy. Um, we have not adopted that um, as of yet. We've just used exceeding, uh, been exceedingly cautious in terms of uh, in terms of patients who are on maintenance therapy. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the biggest risks to patients who have ALL and acute leukemia um, are the uh, the risks from the leukemia itself. And so, you know, the, these these are diseases that still need to be treated. And, uh, and so we've um, tried to just treat them as carefully as possible and, and using all, all sort of COVID-19 precautions. Um, 
the, um, the other thing that's come up is, um, you know, the, the sort of types of therapies that we use. And so in ALL, we use a lot of, you know, lymphoid suppressive therapies, steroids, um, B cell suppressive therapies. And um, these are, um, uh, these are therapies that, you know, could um, theoretically, you know, blunt a response to COVID-19. And, um, and so um, special care and caution um, has to be implemented. Uh, and then um, we also use asparaginase, especially in younger patients. And, um, you know, asparaginase is associated with a clotting risk. Um, there uh, has been described a, a, a COVID-induced coagulopathy. And I'll tell you, as a hematologist, I'm starting to see these patients in my clinic who um, have recovered from COVID or, or at, the, at the sort of tail end of, of their infection with COVID, they develop um, uh, clots uh, and venous thromboembolisms. And so this sort of COVID-induced coagulopathy is an, is an entity that's being described. And uh, I think that, um, you know, it deserves special consideration for patients that are on asparaginase therapy. Um, and then lastly, um, we have a number of patients sort of uh, who have received intensive therapy and who have hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, and for, you know, in my practice, I've been uh, very liberal with, um, with giving IVIG to patients who have um, uh, low gamma globulin. Um, and the reason is uh, because, you know, in, for instance, in patients with uh, CVID, there's a clear association with giving IVIG and preventing um, upper respiratory infections. And so if there's any benefit at all <clears throat> to these patients, um, then, you know, we would advocate for giving IVIG. Uh, IVIG. Um, and so that kind of encompasses the patients, uh, the patients after um, treatment, especially. Um, <clears throat> in general, I would say that this offers an opportunity for us, though, to investigate some um, degree of lower intensity therapies. So, um, you know, <clears throat> um, lower intensity therapies may uh, be less myelosuppressive and may, you know, put patients at lower risk uh, for COVID-19. Um, and sort of when and where to incorporate those is, um, I think, is kind of an art, it's something that ne needs to be carefully considered uh, before those kinds of decisions are made. Because at the end of the day, you know, these patients with acute leukemia need their leukemia treated. very regularly. So, um, you know, we have a screening process for any patient that comes into the clinic. Um, there are, um, uh, you know, there is a clear need to monitor patients' counts during therapy. Uh, and so um, we still have to have patients come into the clinic to monitor their counts, but we do so very carefully. And we have sort of maximally utilized uh, telemedicine. Um, we're using um, uh, telemedicine video visits like this interview. Um, to um, to see a lot of our patients. I think in Colorado, at the height of COVID, I was seeing about two thirds of my patients via telemedicine. Um, that number has uh, decreased, uh, but as you know, just in the recent days, we've seen an uptick in COVID. We're actually doing a little bit more telemedicine again. So it went from about two thirds down to about ten percent telemedicine, and now it's it seems like it's probably going back up a little bit for acute leukemia patients and ALL patients. Um, these are patients, like I said, that need to have their labs tracked and they do need to be monitored closely. Um, but one strategy that I've adopted is to um, actually, uh, at times, uh, if, if the physical exam is not something that is absolutely necessary, we have patients check their labs and then we can do a telemedicine visit. Um, and so the patient is quick in and out just to check labs into the clinic um, and it really limits their exposure. Um, we also, um, you know, administer a lot of therapies in the infusion center. And so, again, we, we have screening strategies in place. Um, we, we've adopted very, um, you know, careful uh, uh, practices to try and minimize patients' risks um, when they come into the infusion center as well. So those are the kinds of things that we've done. We've maximally utilized telemedicine um, and, and telehealth in order to try and minimize patients' exposure and minimize patients' risks. So on all fronts, we're, we just, we're trying to minimize the COVID-19 exposure. Uh, no, I think that, that, probably, um, that probably covers it. Um, you know, there, there are certain risks that I think are associated with patients who have uh, acute leukemia. Um, you know, there is a risk of delay in treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, in general, 
we know that earlier intervention, earlier treatment is advantageous uh, for patients with acute leukemia, like, like I've kind of emphasized. The, perhaps the biggest risk to acute leukemia patients is the, um, is the leukemia itself. And so um, I, I think that um, therapy should not be delayed, but should be carefully considered and done so in, um, in a, as careful a way and, and taking all precautions as possible. Um, and that's, that's what we've done and that's what we're trying to do uh, at Rocky Mountain Cancer Centers, um, where we see a lot of, uh, a lot of leukemia and, and blood cancer patients. So.